Um, at, thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to be part of this, the opportunity to be able to uh, connect with those with IDD and their families across Canada and talk about what I agree is a very important uh, area to be thinking about, not just now, but going forward. Um, there we go. So we do have a polling question for you just to start off with. Since COVID-19, are you experiencing greater mental health challenges? And so I think you can see on the screen that uh, the, the large majority, three quarters of those who've answered have said, yes, in fact, you have, you are experiencing greater mental health challenges. You're not alone and it's not uh, just because you have IBD, there's many people across Canada who are really struggling with the challenges of COVID, of social isolation, of all of the changes that have happened. So uh, hopefully some of the session today will help to give you some ideas about where to go with that. Thank you for, thank you for letting us know about that. There we go. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, go back to a little bit about what Eric was saying a moment ago in trying to get a big picture view of where this pandemic might be taking us. And uh, this is a diagram that has been uh, going around. I think it helps to give an, a, a sense of it's not just about COVID and the impact, COVID-19, the impact of the disease. You see that in the purple wave there. That's where all of our attention has been focused uh, in the health system. And of course, I think across the country and even in day to day is preparing for and protecting from COVID. Um, and you'll see that uh, over the, the first hit, we seem to be kind of coming, starting to come down through that first wave. We're anticipating there probably are going to be more waves. But if you look at other impacts in the healthcare system, you look at what's called that second wave. Uh, that's focusing on other areas, uh, other aspects of health um, that may be where we're, uh, people might be coming into hospital for other reasons than COVID. And we need to start paying attention to and picking up and caring for uh, that area. Also though, uh, chronic disease were just concerns that many people have been waiting to look after their illness and that uh, we're gonna see some impacts of that. But the fourth wave is that red line that you see. So early into the, um, the, the onset of the COVID pandemic spread, we start to see some impact of um, on people's mental health, how they're feeling about things, how they're managing. But as you can see, that actually keeps rising over quite an extended time. And that is the prediction um, from what we know from past pandemics that um, there may be a cumulative effect for people, uh, just the wear and tear of all of the changes, all of the pressures, uh, economic, health, and so on over time. So we have some awareness that we have to be ready. Um, and that maybe there's things we can do now that are going to um, help people recognize and manage with um, their stress and with their mental health to be able to uh, weather this and move forward. So a number of you said that you in fact have noticed the mental health challenges or changes since the beginning of COVID. You are definitely not alone. There have been a number of different surveys across Canada that have um, been asking some of those same questions. And just want to highlight um, some information. These surveys were done late April, so we're already a few weeks past that. But um, just to highlight, that the number of people who are regularly feeling stress has doubled since the beginning of COVID. So about 20% of the population was saying, yeah, before COVID, I often felt quite stressed. Now it was almost 46% of the population is saying more recently, I'm feeling stressed all the time. Half of the population surveyed, these are all adults, uh, we're reporting that their mental health is worsening. And in fact, one in 10 were saying it's really worsened quite a lot. And um, looking more specifically, not just generally at mental health, that's a pretty broad term, but thinking more specifically about common mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. This was asking just, you know, again, generally, Whatever your anxiety level was before COVID, what has it been like? This, you know, late April was again this survey. And people were indicating, you know, for the most part, many didn't have super high anxiety levels. 
but uh, before COVID, but uh, that those levels um, have quadrupled. So about 20% are saying, I now have really high anxiety levels. And similarly with depression, that a very small number were saying I've got you know super high level of depression, um, but uh, but more recently are saying yes that's gone up too, and that was taken down another uh, sort of a one more level to ask about well, what about those of you who've been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder so have kind of a clinical level of anxiety or depression. And those levels um, have, uh, the anxiety levels or depression levels for those individuals has also doubled. Um, and a great question was asked, if social isolation has to continue for another couple of months, what do you think is going to happen? And those individuals in particular um, were, were reporting that we think that the you know, depression is going to go up even higher. So this just tells us this has been hard. This has been hard on people. Um, I don't know about in other provinces, but I know in Manitoba there was a, a recent report in the paper that said that uh, alcohol sales have gone up, and so that's one retail business that was thriving, and amongst all the others that weren't. Um, and of course, the question is, what's happening with all that alcohol that's been sold? So one of the questions uh, was that, in fact, there uh, there is a report that people are increasing. Uh, consuming more, they're having more alcohol, and if they are someone who uses marijuana, they actually, a significant number, are increasing the amount of marijuana they're using. Um, also, if you do have um, uh, anxiety or depression, there was a larger proportion of people who were reporting higher levels of alcohol or cannabis. Um, interestingly, none of those individuals felt that this was a problem or moving into a problem substance use, uh, but I think that those are things that we need to be mindful of or be watching for. So what about, uh, so that was talking more generally about the adult uh, population across Canada. Um, there has uh, been a few surveys starting to look at, well, what about people specifically like those with IBD? So this is a European study that just uh, was published quite recently. And I don't think Canada was particularly well represented in it, um, but some of the European countries um, and, and other countries around the world had a fair number of uh, people who are participating. And I just highlighted a few of the things that came up from that. A large, uh, you know, the vast majority of people quite concerned about getting COVID or contact with others, and particularly concerned about infecting others. So that, that sort of sense of responsibility for others. Um, and also a significant number concerned about what's the impact of the medications they take on their own risk. So this is really helpful to get a sense of what might be on the minds of and concerning for those with IBD. So that was European data. There's a study that's just started that's broadly across Canada and um, is looking also including in that subgroups of people who might have different health issues. So there's some very preliminary data with right now a fairly small number of people who've responded and was predominantly in terms of GI conditions, IBD or IBS, but we're really seeing some similar things. Uh, significantly elevated stress, um, sleep was flagged as something that uh, for a third of people has uh, really changed for them since COVID has started and also feeling more anxious about their health. But also helpful to see if you look on the, the other side here that a very large number of these individuals anyway were saying that they do feel they're getting some good support. Um, they have been doing things like exercising regularly and they've been looking for ways to manage that. Um, but already a quarter have been accessing resources for COVID-related mental health concerns. So this is just get really helpful to give a bit of a window into um, how people are responding and how this might be impacting them. And why is this uh, why is this important? Well, I mean, it's important because uh, these will have these can have lasting impacts. But thinking even more specifically about inflammatory bowel disease and much of the work that Dr. Bernstein and I have done over many years has been looking uh, quite closely at um, the mental health needs and impact uh, for those who have IBD. And we do know that stress can impact IBD. It can increase uh, disease flares, um, among other challenges. And we also know that there's a greater vulnerability for anxiety or depression for those who have IBD. So there's a bit of a, a, a layer already of stress and mental health conditions um, having an effect on inflammatory bowel disease. And then we layer on top of that a really challenging time 
for um, many people um, related to this COVID pandemic, uh, there's a lot to be figured out here. So stress is, is, is going to be a common experience of most people um, across this pandemic, but also I think a, a take home message for today is that resilience, adaptive responding, being able to manage out of and through the acute challenges of the stresses right now, resilience is the norm, not the exception. And so as much as many people are feeling a lot of stress right now, um, and may be struggling. Um, there's, there's many ways people can kind of get their feet back under them, uh, connect with others, help others, help each other, connect in with other resources and be able to move forward. And this is just a few snapshots of things that probably many of you are familiar with. A group that's um, you know, having, making their choir virtually if they can't do it in person, ways to connect with family members and even ways to get outside and be able to still maintain distance and practice those safe behaviors. So just to talk a little bit more, look a little bit more at uh, what this impact might be um, and how it might show itself, the, the impact of uh, COVID and the um, you know, social distancing requirements, the economic changes and so on. I'm just going to touch briefly on each of these four areas uh, that really make up how we, uh, how we think and, and feel and manage. So first of all, looking at how the what reactions we might have in terms of our thinking or the what's running through our heads. And worry is a big part of that. And this is what we hear from lots of people and what the surveys um, are telling us as well. There's lots to worry about. And if we dial back to three months ago, um, when we really didn't know how this was going to you know, unfold in uh, Canada um, and how we didn't know much about COVID, how readily it might um, impact us or, or how at risk we might be. Uh, these were a lot of the things that were going on and not just you know worried about being infected or family and friends but just this sense many people experienced about just can't turn my brain off talked about a COVID mental fog so much you're trying to figure out all at once. Not just negative though so uh, other aspects that can that have come up are sort of a, a renewed sort of digging in commitment to what I need to do to be able to get through this. Lots of different emotions uh, coming up for people and different ones at different times, probably some all at the same time. Um, anxiety, fear, anger, I think are some common ones, frustration, sadness. I was talking with a colleague the other day who said when she was driving by the playground and didn't see children at the playground, she was just unexpectedly caught by this sense of sadness. Now that's going to start to change, but I think we haven't paid attention to a um, sense of grief that has come up through this, um, not being able to connect with family members unless they live in the same household, they're in a different province, uh, if there's ill, if there's a, a, a death from the family not being able to be there. So lots of challenges coming up with feelings. But also again, um, not just negative feelings, but the impact has also connected in with what we took for granted, what we're still grateful for, new appreciation for things we may not have noticed before, and uh, a hopefulness in all of this. What about behavior changes? Uh, well, the data tells us that uh, in fact, uh, we have had some changes with uh, a little bit more um, uh, imbibing, um, using substances, um, alcohol in particular. Um, there's a bit of a conversation about the COVID belly, people eating more or trying to support their local restaurants. So there's a change in how we're eating. Um, taking in a lot of information in terms of the COVID, uh, you know, COVID updates and so on. But even, um, you know, making, uh, people have commented on that, you know, making errors, um, not being as, as focused, um, and um, the excessive cleaning is there, just uh, many people who ended up having to be at home uh, started looking in their closets and uh, I guess um, giving their place a bit of a once over because you're in those four walls for quite some time. And physiological, I think this is, was not necessarily on people's radar as much and is a good time to step back and have a sense of how you're doing physically. 
Um, but just having the constant sense of uncertainty, what's going on next, has really translated into things like um, even, you know, the heart beating faster, harder time sleeping, and a lot more tension. People not even realizing that they might be holding their breath a lot of the day, clenching their fists. So all of those are common reactions that are coming up uh, in relation to all these challenges with COVID. And I guess the question is, um, what does that mean and, and what should I be doing about it? I'm going to be talking in a few moments about some ideas about what to do. Um, but just wanted to um, flag or, or kind of think for a moment about um, is there a point where I should be thinking about maybe taking some extra steps uh, to, to connect with help, or whether it's a little bit more with um, peers or family or kind of those natural supports or whether I should be maybe connecting with some mental health resources that might be in my community. And so here are some aspects that can help you to decide if you might need to take some additional steps for care. Um, just we'll go through them quickly, but certainly the distress level, um, if it's really difficult to sleep, if you have no appetite for eating, um, if it's hard to just stop, you know, how you're feeling, the, the thoughts that are going on and can't kind of take a break, connect with something a bit more day-to-day -day or usual. If it's getting in the way of your day-to-day, -day, again, it's hard to stay, uh, it, it's hard to organize yourself to be able to do something, uh, do what you normally would. Um, those who have mental health history, um, there is a vulnerability to this being a time that can really intensify that. Um, if you've been directly exposed to COVID or an outbreak you know, at your workplace or at, in your community, that can really escalate the anxiety and sometimes that might need a bit of extra care or attention. And certainly any significant death or loss or change at any time can really intensify um, how a person is managing and, and uh, where they may need some additional care or help. So what can you do? Uh, there's lots. There's lots that we can do, and I think we've talked about that in one of these past webinars, and I think that's an important aspect of all of this. There are a lot of things that are out of our control here, but there are also many things that you can do, and, it's, and even though uh, there's some really encouraging uh, uh, information that our uh, COVID, uh, the spread of cases is maybe starting to level out and go down, um, I think the prediction in the medical community is that this is likely to ramp back up again or rear back up again in some months. So we need to be thinking not only about what we can be doing now, but paying attention to what we might be wanting to continue to look after. So going back to those four areas physiologically, what are some steps you can do? Um, certainly just paying attention to that muscle tension and um, looking at ways that you can interrupt that a little bit. Even things like just shifting breathing. This box breathing is a way to just in the moment, if you've got that racing heart, is just slow it down. Breathe in and hold, breathe out and pause. Just that kind of step. Exercise is can be a really helpful a stress reliever and important for being able to sleep and um, and con you know and continue on. And actually, that that uh, level of disturbed sleep that I noted earlier, um, keeping a, a sleep routine or getting back to a sleep routine or looking at steps that can help you sleep better uh, is going to be really important for your health generally, and actually is important for your IBD health as well. Um, and as part of looking after whatever health condition you have, including for those of you here that have inflammatory bowel disease, um, part of looking after that is keeping connected with your care team or your, your doctor, particularly if anything changes. What about those feelings, those darn feelings that uh, um, where there's lots of uh, sometimes more intense emotions right now? So a couple of things to think about is often the way we think about things really drives how we're feeling. And so being able to notice what am I, what's going over and over in my head um, that's uh, leading me feeling um, you know, sad or angry. And so part of that's just being aware of. 
also a really practical thing and try it sometimes. It sounds a little bit strange, but it actually can be quite helpful is rather than worrying all day through the day is you kind of just say, hold on, you know, at seven o'clock tonight, well, maybe not seven o'clock, but, you know, let me set aside 20 minutes later today and I'm just going to let those worries come through, come up. Um, and uh, but in the meantime, they're going to go in the back burner. So it's a little bit more of um, hurting, I guess, some of the ways that that worry just keeps doing and putting it in one spot. Um, also looking at what are the things that you're concerned about, feeling worried about, um, where you can where you can do something. Um, and then there are many aspects that are out of our control. And that becomes then focused more on, again, how am I feeling and being able to move um, beyond that and sometimes it's just things like you know distracting um, connecting with somebody so those are just touching quickly on some aspects to do with how you're feeling what about um, all of those things we may have been changing that weren't so helpful for us in terms of behavior so this is not specific to COVID except maybe the one in red there but a lot of uh, steps that are helpful to do uh, and I know you've heard it before but this is the time to be looking at, can I eat you know, fairly regularly a varied diet with uh, food that's going to be uh, nourishing? Um, what about exercising regularly? Making sure you step back, really watching those uh, items that aren't so good for us and connecting with others. And then um, if particularly focusing on work and at home, this is the time to be able to let go a little bit because you just can't do it all. You might be trying to work from home, um, teach school to your children from home, and so it needs to be, you need to delegate some things at times or just um, let go of being able to do all of it in the way you might have before. And I've highlighted the COVID information intake just because, uh, particularly initially, and maybe it's not happening as much now, but initially people talked about having their televisions on all the time, uh, you know, on and also on all the social media. What's next? What can we learn next? And it was information overload. And so looking at doses of information, and again, setting a time, I'm just going to check in once at the end of the day and whatever your favorite place is to get the information, but going to reliable sources. And that can really help with the anxiety that can get ramped up. And what about those thoughts? The way we think about things um, does really drive how we feel about it, how much our heart is racing or not. So this is a, just a quick um, overview of some of what are called cognitive strategies to be able to shift whatever thoughts are stuck in there. And so uh, this is an example of if what's, what's stuck in your head is nothing will ever be the same again, there's ways to step back from that and go, hey, that's just a thought. I mean, we don't know that yet. And in fact, things have changed. And then challenging, you know, challenging that thought as well. It's actually exercising up in your mind rather than just letting all of those um, um, thoughts and concerns just sit there with you. And tied to that thinking or that idea of reframing, in a couple of the surveys that uh, have uh, the Canadian surveys, uh, it wasn't just focused on how difficult has this been for you, what have the changes been, um, but there was some really helpful focus or interesting focus on is there anything um, that's come out of this that you might not have expected that might actually be okay. And uh, the COVID Survey Canada, which is actually one that has uh, just started and is actually ongoing, uh, this is some preliminary information from an open-ended question that asked are there any silver linings. And so if you go through that list, you see that the connection, the sort of intentional connection with family and friends virtually or in person if you can, um, is something that has happened. People were much more likely to reach out and call people they haven't chatted with for a while. Um, the uh, shift into virtual care, uh, all of us who work in hospitals and health centers thought that was still years away. We've been pushing for a long time to have uh, much, many more ways to be able to connect with um, our patients virtually, um, but all of a sudden that's what we're doing all day every day. And even changes in uh, traffic, uh, the, the planes are stopped, the, most of the cars are stopped, many of the buses are stopped. Well, um, you know, during that lockdown period, that has had some, some positive outcomes. 
And uh, if you look on the right there with the Mental Health Research Canada survey, which was done late April, there's a number of ways that activities that are maybe retro now, like reading, wow, um, or uh, the pets are maybe getting a, a positive outcome of COVID because their people are home with them and spending more time with them. So one of the ways to think about flipping COVID, COVID has meant something scary and, um, and concerning and unknown. And uh, so there's a, a, a colleague by the name of uh, Russ Harris, um, who does some work in the US. And he has uh, suggested that we think about COVID having a different meaning. And so here's a way to uh, maybe, when you think of COVID, not necessarily think just about the virus and its, uh, and its impact, but also what else it can stand for. So COVID can mean committing to action, focusing on what you can do right now. Also that idea of opening up, recognizing that these the feelings, the emotions that you're having um, are not unexpected, they're natural, they're normal, and uh, uh, letting yourself acknowledge that and then letting yourself connect with others, maybe even to reach out and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling a bit. The idea of um, sometimes in a situation like this where we've had these significant changes and uh, difficult challenges is it really gets us focused back on what's important what do we really value and so looking at uh, out of what i want to do or what i want to make a point of um, ensuring i'm doing it, it does it tie to what's important and uh, and what i value and then the i in covid was around identifying uh, resources that you might need, and that could be a, a family friend that could maybe give you some childcare relief. Um, it might be just the uh, a, a, a friendly face. Um, it might be some particular mental health resources, or even knowing what the crisis resources are in case um, that, that you or a family member is really, really struggling. And the last one, oh, I'm, I went too quickly, I didn't pause. But the last one was, if I can go back, uh, no, apparently not. Um, the last one that was around D was, was just um, being able to uh, develop a plan, to develop a wellness plan. I wonder, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, being able to look at, at uh, uh, particularly going forward, even as things are easing up right now, we may not be feeling the same stress or pressures, but anticipating that, uh, we're likely going to have the uh, COVID uh, cases increasing again. What's going to help you going forward? And then this doesn't translate well, but we can uh, put it up on the um, uh, Crohn's and Colitis website uh, after this. But this is an example of how you might want to map out a wellness plan for yourself. And it's a little bit squished on the slide, but it's just looking at what are some things that are important for you to do day to day. And this was helpful, particularly in the social distancing period. But again, it may be something that's useful going, going on. Um, what are some things to make a point of doing occasionally? The things I should avoid doing because they're probably not going to be so helpful for my health. And importantly, what are my early warning signs that I'm starting to struggle or feel more distressed? What can I do in response to that? And um, if it does get into something really significant, um, what are some crisis resources or crisis responses? So that can be a bit of a map to doing that. And there are many resources. Um, locally, nationally, and, and uh, of course, uh, you can pick up many of them online. I just had uh, identified a few here that are um, focused on um, COVID and understanding the impact on mental health and some ideas about some steps to do as well. So just would put them out there for your interest, but know that that's not by any means an exhaustive list. So I hope this information has been helpful. Uh, there's many colleagues in my department who have been working um, with individuals, with, with colleagues, with frontline healthcare workers and others who have pulled together some of this information as well. I just want to acknowledge them. But thank you for the, um, the opportunity to be able to go through some of these ideas. I know we have some time for questions. I know Dr. Bernstein would like to get in there and then we'll have some good um, ideas and information as well. So I hope this was helpful for you.